Maybe you have noticed this. In a cartoon drawing, when the depiction is of something or someone moving at fast speed, the cartoonist will draw some horizontal lines in the air behind it. A man running, a woman biking, a book being thrown out a window, three little horizontal lines or so to indicate speed call them speed lines. The poet Billy Collins has played with that image in a poem called Velocity, and here are some of the lines. I imagine we all, we would all appear to have speed lines behind us as we rush along the road of the world, as we rush down the long tunnel of time, the biker, of course, but also the man reading by a fire. Speed lines coming off his shoulders and his book. The poem concludes with the image of a child asleep in her bed, her body perfectly motionless, and speed lines flying from the posters of her bed. Well, doesn't that tell some truth about how our lives go speeding through time? For many of us, there are stretches of our lives when we are super, super busy doing way too many things in too many places and our bodies and minds become exhausted and maybe we say to ourselves, finally, you have got to slow down. Or maybe something slows us down, as in, for instance, a pandemic. And we discover to our surprise that still the days, weeks, months go blurring by. We look up and ask, what month is this? September? Speed lines on everything. The ancient saying goes, tempest fugit, time flies. Maybe we might better say it's you and I that are flying, hurling through our years, speed lines on our shoulders and the shoulders of the world. And so the news has it again. Black man runs, policeman fires, crowd cries out for justice, some violence occurs, government condemns. Meanwhile, hurricanes and wildfires come, speed lines behind it all. The Bible, always relevant, keeps trying to tell us that this is so. In more than one place, it says, we are like grass, lush and green, and then all of a sudden, brown and burned up. And then today, this text from the Apostle Paul, who says, The night is far spent. The day is already at hand. Wake up. You know what time it is. Time to be clothed in light time to put aside the works of darkness as in drunkenness and reveling. Specifically, Paul is referring to what's called the day of the Lord, when Christ returns and time as we know it is ended, and a new age of light is begun. He is saying, you've been sleeping through the passage of time. Wake up and be ready to greet the brand new age. He's thinking in those terms as Christians still do. But we can also rightly think of this text in terms of something for us less cosmic as if to say, look, endings are coming to us all. Opportunities spring up before us now. 
So walk as you are in the light, as you are able, while you can. Here's something extra to notice about this text. The call to live in the urgency of time follows right on the heels of a reminder that we are commanded to love each other. Paul hammers it in three times. Love each other, love each other, love your neighbor as yourself. Do you know what time it is, he says. Wake up, live in this light. You see what he's done. Once again, he's linked necessity to love with the facts of time. He has set the great commandment, love one another. And alongside it, he has placed a clock. See how short the time is? Speed lines streaming off the shoulders of everyone. Speed lines speeding off the shoulders of the world. Not only is it urgent to love because the time is short, but also because, as it turns out, everything that is wrong among us amounts to a shortage, a deficit of love. That's what Paul seems to say. He puts it like this. Look, every commandment is summed up in the commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. When God commands you, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and all the other commandments, they are all summed up in the single great command. Love one another, love your neighbor as you love yourself. That is a radical truth. That every sin we commit amounts to a failure of love. Our pridefulness is lovelessness. Our stinginess, our abusiveness, our destructiveness, infidelities, our judging, our falsehoods. Every bit of it comes down to a betrayal of love. And it's the same of the social order. The gross inequities of our economic system equal lovelessness. The desecration of the environment is lovelessness. Denial of access to health care for anyone equals lovelessness. Consumerism is lovelessness, refusing to take responsible precautions to keep from infecting other people with COVID is pure and simple lovelessness. And our culture of lust and overindulgence, self-righteousness, disinformation, violence, prejudice, misogyny, white supremacy. It is all part of the great societal wrecking ball that smashes to bits the commandment to love one another, to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Don't you see what time it is, says Paul. For the longest time, people could see the love command as being like most really great advice. Love your neighbor as yourself, and they're better off, and you're a better person, and the world is a better place, and God is pleased. But now, look at the weapons we possess. Look at how contagions sweep across the globe. Look at the rising, swelling tide of meanness 
and the awful truth begins to dawn that unless we learn to love our neighbor, we will not survive. When Nazism exploded into World War II, the poet W. H. Auden wrote a poem in which there are these lines. All I have is a voice to undo the folded lie. We must love each other or die. There it is again. The connection between love and death. The divine command to love linked to the brevity of our time. Do you think it is possible that our failures in love rise in part from our failures to accept the truth of death, our own dying, the dying of everyone, the dying of our world. Three, three years ago, I listened to a TED talk by a very successful product designer named Richard Seymour. He titled his talk, How Beauty Feels. At one point, he showed his audience a slide of a picture clearly drawn by a child of a flower and a butterfly flying from it. It was crudely, naively drawn with a single gray crayon, just the lines of a flower and a butterfly. He said, look at it. Is it beautiful? Is it exciting? And he noted that some men in the crowd appeared to be bored. Then he said, let me tell you what this is. This is a, the last act on this earth of a little girl named Heidi, five years old, before she died of cancer of the spine. It is the last act of her life. Now look at it. Is it beautiful? And he noted that one person in the audience had begun to weep. A moment ago, just a piece of paper, crayon, flower, butterfly, crudely drawn by a child. The only information we lacked was what time it was for the child. And suddenly the drawing is luminous, transcendent, communicating pathos and power and love and hope. All it took was realizing the time it was for a five-year-old little girl. How much difference would it make if we could begin to see everyone in exactly that light? That every one of us has drawn nearer in every moment to the end Deeper than appearance, everyone at every moment is vulnerable, fragile, mortal, living in poignant brevity. If we could see in each member of our family, in our friends, in strangers, and in those we regard as enemies, what time it is for them, would we not begin for most of them to see with wiser eyes that they are more precious and more beautiful than we had ever begun to realize. It is time and past time to wake up and see 
Time is passing for them all. Time is passing for the world. And the same, of course, is true for you and for me. Speed lines still flying from our shoulders too. We are precious and rare in time. Our opportunities are beautiful and urgent. So now and here is the time to do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with our God, and to be clothed in light.